Hello listeners and welcome to the Afriweta podcast where we look to celebrate African history and culture by telling our story. As always, our hope is that it fills you with enough curiosity to go and do your own deeper research. Links to all episodes can be found on this podcast platform. Please visit us on social media. Our handle is at Afriwetu across all our platforms, Twitter and Instagram, where we shall be posting interesting facts, stories, updates and links for all further study for all you lovely people. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we are headed to the heartland of our continent, deep into where the River Congo and its tributaries begin. Leaving our previous kingdom of Congo behind, entering into the Upemba region, the core of the Luba Empire, the second in our trilogy of West to Central African civilizations. So now, just sit back and enjoy the journey. So in terms of the modern location, the heartland of the Luba Empire was in what is today's modern-day DRC, the Upemba grasslands. And today you can actually go to see the Upemba National Park, which is in Katanga, which is about 400 kilometers from Lubumbashi. The empire's influence and sovereignty was felt from the east, Lake Tanganyika, to the west, the borders of present-day northern Angola. So now we have the image in our minds. Let's take a quick peek in the 5th century AD and note the collection of communities inhabiting this central region. Okay, so noted. Now, let us jump about 1,000 years forwards It is now the 14th century AD, and we can see these communities have formed what looks to be a conglomerate of sorts. It's the beginning of something big. So this conglomerate has been referred to as a commonwealth, a civilization, a kingdom, and even an empire. And if you remember the second Afriwetu episode titled Setting the Scene, Back to Basics, we covered the last three terminologies. In fact, this is considered an empire by historians, so we shall continue to use that term. This empire is well-renowned when it comes to our history and was a remarkable one worth studying. At its height in the late 14th and 15th centuries AD, it spread across Central Africa and its influence can still be seen today with the Luba peoples, both historically and linguistically. In fact, these traits can also be seen with the Shankaji from Katanga, the Bambo of Kasai, and the Hemba of northern Katanga and southern Kivu, who are all found in modern-day DRC. So, how did it come about, you ask? What is the origin? The tales of the founding fathers are a mix of fact and fable, but then again, aren't almost all. For the purposes of this particular episode, we'll stick to the facts. The founding father of the Lumba Empire was Nkongolo Mwamba, a Songhai from the north of Upemba. He was considered an evil man, a drunkard and selfish in his ways with a low moral character. He was a cruel ruler and was also known as the Muntu wa Malwa basically one sent to terrorize. Or his other term was also the Red King because of his red skin, which is also the color of blood. So now, who was to save the people? Well, this evil king was overthrown by Kalala Ulunga. Kalala was actually the son of a favored prince called Ilunga Mbindi Kilue. Mbindi was seen as a gentle, well-mannered, and civilized man. His son Kalala had his father's traits, and he was seen as the ideal ruler, caring and compassionate and well-beloved by his people, and still revered to this day. He was also known to be very handsome due to his dark complexion that was, and still is, seen as a sign of beauty. There was some mystery around Kalala Ilunga, 
And some say he and Ilunga Mbindi Kilue were the same person. We here believe that they were actually father and son, but it is an open platform. So please let us know what you think. Also, before I forget, please tune in to the fable and folklore episode that looks at the more mythical origin story of Kalala Ilunga. Follow us on our social media handles for details as to when it will be aired. All right, so back to the empire. It mushroomed quite rapidly, and much can be attributed to its politically strategic alliances and economic savvy, on top of its military conquests. This expansion started in the late 15th century, AD 1500, with Upemba at the heart of it, stretching from Lake Tanganyika and Lake Mweru in the east, all the way across to Lake Lubilash. All these areas were considered subordinates to the empire, and at its peak, it had no less than a million people paying tribute. The expansion of the empire has been attributed in part to three notable rulers, Ilungu Sungu, who reigned from A.D. 1780 to A.D. 1810, Kumwimbe Ngombe, who ruled till A.D. 1840, and then Ilunga Kabale, who was at the helm circa 1870. Now, seeing as we've already started talking about rulers, let us actually look at how they ruled and what the governance system of the Lumba was. So the empire was centered around its ruler, the Mulopwe, spelt M-U-L-O-P-W-E, who claimed to be descendants of Kalala Ilunga with a sacred right to the throne. This divine right was then reinforced by a blessing from the royal spiritual diviner at an initiation ceremony to the throne, which was a very complex coronation ceremony. It was at this ceremony that it was stressed that the weight of the people's well-being was upon the Mulopwe's shoulders. You must be a just and moral ruler, Mulopwe. You must show compassion to your people. You must rule with a strong hand and make sure that the rivalries in the elite never spill into our people, causing any civil strife. It is your sacred duty to protect us from outsiders who want to raid and overpower our lands. In the same way, you are also tasked with expanding this great empire. The ways are at your disposal. When others hear of us, let them shudder and explain, The empire is coming! But remember, you cannot just do as you please, Mulopwe. We are a proud people. And there are those who have the power to remove you, should you not honor your role. So Mulopwe, the welfare of the people is upon you. You have to govern according to the will of the ancestors and obey the constitutional powers. Because if you do not, hmm. Well, you have seen what has happened before. Don't let that be your fate. So as a quick aside, who you ask are these mysterious others? So, there was a society, secret in its membership, called the Bambuje, spelt B-A-M-B-U-D-Y-E. They held the responsibility of remembering the history of the empire from its origins. And in fact, their interpretations of history directly influenced the rulers of the day. They were very powerful and seemed to be one of the checks and balances of the Mulopwe. They even had the right to execute the Mulopwe if they were deemed to have excessively abused their powers. So, despite the Mulopwe having these divine rights, they were not in any way gods. And actually, strangely enough, only at their death did they attain divine status. Even their hometowns became shrines and their legacies to be remembered by the Mbudia society. So, 
So, going back to the governance, the next level under the Mulopwe were the aristocrats in the courts, known as the Bamfumus. Outside of the courts, we then had the regions governed by the Balopwe, the paramount chiefs slash clan kings, who were also royalty in their own right, and their positions were actually hereditary. Bordering the empire were the states that, in order to keep favor with the Mulopwe, offered tribute, and they even went as far as incorporating the Luba traditions. These included the culture and religion. We shall come back to the religion in just a bit. One of the most potent Luba trades that was adopted was its artistry, which lives on in the carvings of figures and headdress that is still practiced today, especially by the Shankaji and the Hemba. The artistry has an interesting legacy when it comes to the ruling class. Well, I found it interesting. The Luba kings and nobility had staffs that were specially carved with female figures. These were in pairs and thought to represent the twin spirits of Luba kingship. When there was a single female figure, it was said to be of a dead king spirit. So the position of women was a privileged one. They represented the formation and birth of the kingdom with a very prominent role in the creation myth. So to all my African women out there, please take note. The people were also well-renowned for their iron forging skills, in particular the axes and spears, which were seen as royal symbols and closely linked to Kalala Ilungu. It is claimed that he brought the skills to the peoples as well as the skills of using archery to hunt and fight. So the last pre-colonial Luba, Mulopwe, was Kasongo Nyembo. He led the state from 1891 to 1917. So going back to religion. The role of the Luba religion is central to understanding their genuine belief in the need for good governance and values. And this is because it was rooted in their spiritual values. The notion of Bumuntu, a word that is found in Bantu languages that refers to the authentic and genuine humanity of good moral character being at the core. There was the belief in a universal creator, Shakapanga, belief in life after death with a strong sense of the ancestors being a part of the day-to-day, -day. so a communion between the living and the dead. They used to hold ceremonies to invite the dead from the supernatural world into the village, as well as playing homage and tribute to the ancestors, called the Banakombo, and the spirits, called the Mikishi. On Earth, the spiritual representatives were the Kitobo were the priests, the Nanga were the healers, and because for every good there is an evil, the Mwinfintishi, enemy of the ancestors. I'll spell it for you because I'm sure some of you know how to pronounce this better. It's M-F-W-I-N-T-S-H-I. It was a very deep-rooted religion and one that was spread to all Luba subjects, including those who were conquered. So now, we have looked at the origins, the expansion, the religion, and the governance. So now let's go to the economy. The empire managed to take over control of existing trade routes, which passed through it, and with that became the connectors of the two oceans, mainly the Indian Ocean in the east and the Atlantic Ocean in the west. So it is no small feat to have had this control, and as a result, we can see why it became a very wealthy kingdom. These trade routes could be traced back to the 10th century AD. When the empire took control of them, the ruling class was put in charge to manage the trade, which also meant that they monopolized it. And it was they, the ruling class, who were then tasked to handle the redistribution of wealth across the empire. The empire traded in salt, iron ore, ivory, and slaves. And in addition, they also had easy access to copper from the copper belt of what is now modern-day Zambia, a metal that became so common people actually got buried in it. As we now know, 
all the trade was in the hands of the elite, right? So what was the rest of society doing? Well, they actually survived on agriculture and fishing. The people farmed sorghum, millet, and cassava, and they also reared livestock. In addition, they also hunted. And this was an important part of the Luba society. Mbindi Kilwe, the father of Kalala Ilunga, was, after all, said to be a great hunter, as was his son, according to some versions of the original story. So hunting was encouraged, and hunters were celebrated, and great hunters held a place of honor in their societies. So what happened? This empire only seems to have been on the up. But then again, all things do come to an end, and the Luba Empire was no exception. So the fall is said to have begun following the death of Ilunga Kabale in 1870. He was then succeeded by Kasongo Nyembo, the last of the Luba dynasty. The Luba's internal wrangling and civil wars ensured that they were never able to match up to the outside forces. The leadership infighting, especially at times of succession to the throne, proved to be a structural weakness. The different factions would get outside backing as well. The violent nature of the internal fighting did not abate, and this led to even greater political fragmentation and an erosion of royal monopolies over the trade and thus the wealth. It ended up losing its power and influence over the neighboring states and people, such as the powerful Ovimbundu people of Angola, who took advantage of this weakness and positioned themselves as the power trade brokers in the region. The entrance of the slave trade was a huge impact on the Luba Empire. The invaders from the Muslim and Europeans who came to search for slaves held raids on the communities and destroyed the fabric and the units of the society. It was difficult to maintain supremacy in the region, and by the late 1800s, the Luba Empire was a shadow of itself, and shortly after, the empire collapsed. In doing the research for this empire, many things came up that were fascinating, which could not all be covered here. So for now, with the Luba, there were a few things that stood out that for here is everywhere too, I just wanted to share. First, women really do rock. The role of women in representing kings, and we see this through the fact that the female form was one of such prestige that it was carved into figures, and these were regarded as royal symbols proving that they held a prominent role in Luba's political history. Secondly, the role that the religion had, the importance of the principles of moral character that was the foundation of their system of statecraft. To the extent where the Mulopwe was still kept in check by a society whose members were there to ensure that there was no excessive abuse of power and that he could be executed if this happened. Lastly, their model of governance was adopted throughout the region that is modern-day northern Angola and Zambia and southern DRC. One of the most important polities that also adopted the system, as well as the culture, was the Lunda Empire to the south, which we shall be looking at in a future Afriwetu episode. So on that note, I do hope that this episode has gotten you listeners curious enough to dig further. There are so many layers of history and the need to revisit and go deeper into the civilizations must really be quite obvious by now. And as usual, links shall be added to our social media pages. Here ends our journey to the Luba Empire. I do hope that you enjoyed today's show. Thank you for listening. And until next time, Mubarikiwe. So I'd like to give a shout out and a huge thank you to my dream team, for one, Mwendua Mbugwa, for the direction and for all the support she's given me for Afriwetu. And then I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Big City Studios for editing, mixing, sourcing the music, the sound effects, basically all things production in relation to Afriwetu because it really does make a difference and brings these stories to life. Thank you. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it.